Hello, uh, I'm Mishka and uh, this channel is the Helsinki Renaissance where we will be talking about arts and culture in uh, hopefully uh, a very uh, protean manner that uh, uh, restores uh, the people's faith in uh, uh, some souls still having renaissance-like abilities in this era of hack frauds. Uh, um, anyway, perhaps this is a, a good introduction uh, for a, another series, uh, another entry in the series called Flop or Not. And uh, um, um, uh, I sort of started, uh, um, I started this video uh, once earlier, but then something made me, uh, something made me, uh, uh, stop the recording in the middle and then, um, uh, I never got around to, uh, returning to it. Uh, but, um, anyway, uh, perhaps now is a good time. So, um, there was a situation, uh, perhaps, um, around a month ago, where uh, I had seen a trailer for uh, a movie that had completely uh, uh, eluded me when it came out, uh, very generically called The Lovers. Uh, it was um, a fairly recent uh, Roland Joffe movie. Uh, I think it was like a... Did IMDB list it in like 2013, but uh, perhaps there was the kind of situation that it was shot uh, some years ago, but then only released in a lot of territories in like 2015. So they, uh, I mean, clearly the production company didn't have that much confidence in it or something. Uh, like. I, I mean, I don't know, but I'm assuming that its release was delayed, which is never a very good sign. So, um, because I uh, I had never heard of The Lovers, uh, I, I assume it must have been a flop. But then again, I don't know, um, like, I don't know whether it's officially a flop, because it can just have been a fairly a more or less inexpensive movie that that was just sort of obscure the way that Tarsem signs The Fall. Uh, it was just a movie that was maybe like slightly obscure rather than a flop. But anyway, I'm operating under the assumption that uh, The Lovers by uh, Roland Joffe, that it could conceivably be a flop. Like, I don't know whether it's sort of stretching the... Uh, definition of flop because really uh, a flop should be a movie that uh, like uh, a flop should be expensive so like movies that are cheap to produce cannot be flops not not really like uh, it's it's only a big investment that goes uh, goes wrong for everyone involved like that should be a proper flop but we may extend the definition of flops just enough to include the lovers. In that, uh, let's say that uh, it was still rather expensive and it cannot have made a lot of money. So let's say maybe it's a flop. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, 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 when I was searching for the lovers, uh, I, I was uh, looking whether my... Uh, uh, whether the libraries here in Helsinki would have it, and they didn't. But uh, uh, that search for the lovers led me to another Josh Hartnett movie called Bunraku. Uh, now, uh, Bunraku, uh, like a... Um, uh, like, with the lovers, like, um, it... it uh, it, it, it didn't surprise me that I had never heard of it because I, I have basically stopped 
paying attention to contemporary cinema. I just assume that it's basically all bad and uh, all films that are just sort of uh, uh, tired rehashings of uh, better movies that I've seen in the past. Uh, so uh, uh, I I don't pay any kind of attention to uh, to like new releases anymore. I haven't paid any attention to new releases for quite a long time ago, uh, for for quite a while now. Uh, but uh, Bunraku, um, uh, I think uh, I I forget what year it came out, but I think it uh, I think Bunraku premiered in the same year as uh, Inception from Christopher Nolan and Black Swan by Darren Aronofsky and uh, Social Network from David Fincher and so on. So, uh, like, was that 2010? Like, I was definitely still, uh, like, reading film industry news in 2010. So, like, uh, like I was paying a lot of attention to the film industry in 2010 when Bunraku came out and like I, I I've never heard anyone say anything about Bunraku before like uh, I mean Bunraku uh, like uh, that that should be more legitimately seen as a flop now uh, the only reason why I uh, uh, stumbled a bon bunraku because I was looking uh, at the Roland Joffe uh, Roland Joffe movie that I like uh, how it was pitched to me I thought that it was a time travel movie so uh, I became interested but uh, then later on when I watched the movie it turned out that it's not exactly a time travel movie so well I mean uh well, uh, it's as if that the lovers movie sort of uh, cheated its way into my interests. So, like, uh, uh, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have had much of an interest in it. But then, like, I like Josh Hartnett as an actor. And then, uh, well, since I halfway became interested, I was like, ah, I might as well watch it and see what happens. So, like, the worst case scenario is that I have two movies to talk about in this flop or not series. So, um, anyway, um, like, my initial interest was in the, the Lovers movie, but then when I uh, found out about Bunraku, it actually started to interest me more. Like, Bunraku was meant as a side dish, like, an, an accidental side dish to something that I didn't even really order <laughs> to begin with. Uh, but uh, uh, like uh, I looked at the trailer and it looked like a mess. I mean, it looked like a really stupid movie. Like the the, the trailer was just really badly cut. Like uh, the trailer made it look way more generic than what the movie actually will be when a person has seen it. But like uh, when I was there just watching the trailer, I was like, this looks horrible. Uh, what the hell is this? But because the title is Bunraku, uh, which is referring to the Japanese puppet theater, like I was really interested to see in that how does an American action movie have the title of Japanese puppet theater? So like a Bunraku was a movie that I could get from the library. So uh, uh, I decided to get it and uh, I thought that uh, well, if nothing else, like, I'll have something to talk uh, in this flop or not. N not serious. But, uh, uh, so I was Bunraku first, and then I was the lovers afterwards. Uh, I had to, um, I had to search a while till I was able to get it, but uh, I was able to get it. Uh, um, but anyway, um, uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, those two movies just sort of uh, accidentally uh, came to my attention and uh, I'm glad that they did because um, uh, for this uh, flop or not, if we uh, um, adopt uh, 
uh, Mike D'Angelo scale of uh, a flop being either a failure, a fiasco, or a secret success. Uh, I thought that uh, the lovers, like, I really debated whether the lovers would be failure or a secret success. Because uh, uh, my problems with the lovers, uh, um, like, um, I think Anthony Mingella's uh, The English Patient is a lot better a movie than The Lovers is. But I had similar problems with The English Patient in that uh, it has uh, two timelines. And uh, I loved one of the timelines and I was annoyed whenever we went to the other timeline. So uh, with The Lovers, if it... Um, if it didn't have the kind of slightly supernatural uh, um, framing device to it and uh, conceit to the movie, which like somebody might say that that was the whole point of the movie to turn it into something like a metaphysical love story or something. But anyway, like even if that was the whole point of the movie, I still didn't like it. Like uh, I... I only like the story within the story or the story in the past. But anyway, like I'm, I'm willing to say that uh, the lovers was just good enough to be a secret success. But with Bunrako, not only do I think it is a secret success, I actually think that uh, like I don't know how long, uh, like how much more I'm gonna do this flop or not uh, series. Is, but, like, I don't imagine that any film will come even close to challenging Bunrako as the best um, of these flops that I've seen. I absolutely loved Bunrako. Like, uh, um, like um, you know, if, if we use the uh, kind of five-star rating... Uh, to this, like, I'd almost be tempted to give Funraku 5 out of 5, which uh, really should only be used a couple of times a year for the absolute best best movies, but, uh, you know, I really, really liked Bunraku. I mean, uh, it's just, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was uh, a fantastic movie, and uh, uh, I think it had something like 20% on Rotten Tomatoes or something, like a really low score, and the IMDb score was pretty low as well. So, like, it seems like a movie that basically no one else seems to have loved, but uh, but I did. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, which one should I do first? Uh, so anyway, if I didn't spell it out too clearly, uh, with the lovers from uh, whatever year it is, uh, it stars Josh Hartnett and Bunraku also stars Josh Hartnett. So I just accidentally uh, came to uh, what to make some sort of a double bill uh, of these films. Um, but uh, let's talk about the lovers first. So anyway, uh, in an earlier. Uh, like uh, or in some other video that I did, uh, I briefly talked about Roland Joffe and that uh, his filmography could also be like uh, a mini or, or like its own episode of flop or not. Uh, in that Joffe, uh, 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 like uh, he started his career uh, as. Um, the kind of uh, Sam Mendes type, uh, you know, director of uh, uh, big budget, uh, mature uh, dramas about uh, weighty matters. So uh, the Killing Fields and the Mission, those were like, uh, they're not the biggest kinds of classic classics out there. So, you know, The Killing Fields and the Mission, like, uh, um, you know, those aren't exactly, you know, uh, Schindler's List and Taxi Driver 
Thug classics, but but like the Killing Fields and the Mission, those are uh, movies that basically uh, everyone who saw them uh, in the 80s like thinks that those are uh, those are you know uh, terrific movies that uh, that they promise a brilliant career for the director, but then Roland Joffe, um uh, he's like. The movie that he made after that, uh, the I think it was called The Fat Man and the Little Boy, uh, which was uh, uh, Paul Newman was starring in uh, a movie about the Manhattan Project. Like that's just like um, that movie is uh, just this uh, kind of. Uh, 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 really dull and dry and you know just meaningless seeming uh, drama about some of the people in like the also run moments involved in the Manhattan Project so like uh, uh, you know I'd say that that, that uh, uh, what is it called Fat Man and the Little Boy movie or whatever it's called, like, to me, like, I mean, that's a flop, and it's a failure, because, like, it's almost a fiasco, because, like, fiasco should be a movie that, uh, that, that is just so far from getting it right, like, uh, I mean, um, like, I, I, I'd almost, like, um, in a way that uh, that movie, uh, I mean, I can't even remember its title. Like usually with flops, like the title just tells you that uh, these are like they couldn't get it right. And uh, I mean, it's it's a true flop. And uh, I don't almost want to call it a fiasco, but it's such a boring, dull, pointless movie that like it's boringness almost cements it into just a normal failure. Like, uh, a fiasco is almost like, it's almost that the movie isn't good enough to be a fiasco, because a fiasco should be interesting, but there's nothing interesting about that particular Manhattan Project movie. Uh, so, like, that was Chaffee's first flop, and then, um... Uh, I think that City of Joy movie that he made out of about Calcutta, I think it may have been a flop if you contrast it to uh, how popular the Killing Fields and the Mission are. But anyway, uh, City of Joy is definitely a secret success. Uh, like I think it's a, it's a movie that lots of people would love if they watched it. Uh, I'm gonna call it a flop because it has Patrick Swayze uh, in it and uh, it definitely should be a bigger classic than it is. But for whatever reason, City of Joy is a movie that just could not find an audience the way that it should have. Like, arguably City of Joy maybe should be Roland Chaffee's most popular movie, but it just somehow oddly got lost. So City of Joy, a secret success. Uh, now, uh, Chaffee's next flop, uh, Battel, starring Gerard Debardieu and uh, Yuma Thurman, uh, I'd say that that's a failure. Like, I'm gonna go that Paul Newman film a fiasco. Uh, like, even though it, it almost doesn't deserve to be a fiasco, but it was just so wrong that maybe maybe we can, can just give it that um but uh anyway um uh Vattel, i'd say it's just a failure because like uh you know it, it it's a pointless seeming uh period piece like Vattel is a really expensive movie but it's the kind of expensive movie that nobody like absolutely nobody asked for it like uh uh, a romance that couldn't quite happen between Gerard Debatio and Yuma Thurman whilst they are putting some sort of a, uh, you know, uh, big 
party that symbolizes the meaninglessness of the aristocratic world. Like, uh, what the hell? It's just a really empty movie. It has nothing going for it. But I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna call it a failure. Um, now, then, uh, then Trophy, he had had so many, fail so many flops in a row that he couldn't quite get big budgets anymore. So then he started doing some kind of trashy movies after that. But I haven't seen them. And uh, like uh, a flop is a movie that underperforms. But uh, if a movie is trashy from the get-go, it almost cannot be a flop. So like, a, you know, like trashy B-films are flop-proof because they were designed to be trashy B-films. So, um... So I'd say that after Vatel, perhaps The Lovers can sort of be Joffy's latest flop. But uh, I'm definitely going to say that uh, it's a secret success the way that City of Joy is a secret success. Because uh, The Lovers, I think, uh, is a movie that uh, it's a flop just because it couldn't find an audience. Like there is an audience for City of Joy. Uh, you know, um, uh, like, uh, uh, City of Joy, like, it, 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 it almost has, like, the feel of a Charles Dickens book in India or something. Like, uh, uh, it, it, like, City of Joy, it sort of reminded me of Empire of the Sun, uh, that, uh, J, uh, J. G. Ballard, Steven Spielberg, uh, project from the 80s with Christian Bale and John Malkovich. Like, uh, uh, like the City of Joy, it's, it sort of reminded me of that. Uh, anyway, uh, like, City of Joy, it's just, it should have found an audience, but it didn't, so it became a flop due to no obvious fault of its own. And I'd say that The Lovers had something similar about it. Uh, now, uh, if if I'd have to compare The Lovers to some other film, uh, I suppose something like Darren Aronofsky's The Fountain, my, like the way that The Fountain sort of tried to be a metaphysical love story. Uh, now, uh, I think The Lovers is a better film than The Fountain, uh, and uh, uh, like... The, the Lovers keeps it a bit simpler. Like, uh, The Fountain is a movie with more questions than answers. I feel like The Lovers is a movie that tries to answer its own mysteries. Uh, and uh, that answering process almost becomes the point of the movie. But, uh, like, it's what I like the least about it. Because... Um, because, like, um, The Lovers happens on two different time, uh, two different uh, timelines, so two different places. So Josh Harden plays two different characters. Uh, there's uh, um, um, uh, a British officer in uh, India of the past. Uh, I can't remember, like... Was it set? Was it set in like seventeen fifties or something like mid eighteenth century at any rate? So uh, Josh Hartnett plays uh, uh, plays uh, a British officer stationed in India, but then uh, the other timeline is that Josh Hartnett he plays some sort of a some sort of modern day scientist, or perhaps it's even set in the near future. Uh, but anyway, like a, a slightly futuristic version of the present day. So like John, uh, Josh Hartnett, uh, he has those two roles, and uh, uh, the movie uh, puts uh, Josh Hartnett, uh, um, how should I put it? Uh, like, the two different versions of Josh Hartnett aren't exactly aware of each other's presence, but, like, something in the movie is, 
linking the two. So even though the characters, like, there are some characters who are aware that the movie is happening in two different time planes. Like, some characters are aware of it, and some characters are, like, sort of influencing uh, the past through the present, or the present through the past, or something. Like, this is something kind of random going on. Like, the movie has some sort of a logic that sort of makes sense within, like, the kind of fairy tale logic way. Um, like, I don't know if the... Uh, what is it? Is it called uh, synchron... What is it called? Synchronicity or something. Like, the idea that uh, two different dots on the o opposite sides of the universe, like, they are just somehow linked, and when one dot... Uh, has when one dot goes through a change instantaneously the other dot also goes through a change or something like that so like it takes some sort of a scientific notion and it sort of plays with it and then the two different timelines of the two different uh, the two Josh Hardnets they are just somehow meant to represent this whole thing like I I don't really understand <laughs> I don't really understand that whole point of the movie because, like, um, I I certainly would say that that uh, when the lovers resembles Aronofsky's uh, fountain even slightly, to me that that is when the movie is a failure, and uh, I'd say that uh, uh, I would say that uh, the movie is a flop because the audiences don't seem to want to go for stuff like that. But uh, anyway, uh, it, it's the story within the story. So when they are in the mid-18th century India, that's when I absolutely love the movie. And I didn't expect to. Uh, I mean, uh, like, I, uh, well, I mean, Roland Joff, uh, he's obviously hit or miss. But, uh, you know, like, um, I, I, I haven't entirely written him off, you know. Uh, I used to have a, a, a film critic that I, I, I read uh, who had this uh, personal stance that you should never count out an author because like even like, no matter how many misfires they have in a row, if they've had some personal greatness to them in the past, like, you never know when they have another great moment. And I think that uh, Roland Joffe uh, sort of uh, would prove uh, uh, would prove that idea that you should never count out an author. An author because, like, uh, I, uh, um, I borrowed uh, some Roland Joffe, uh, like, some... Uh, stupid schlocky title called Texas Rising. I couldn't even watch it. It looks so dumb. I mean, it, um, it, it, I mean, it looks so dumb that uh, it could make the 300 movie of, uh, you know, Sparta says no. Uh, look like some BBC documentaries. I, I mean, when I say that uh, the Texas Rising look dumb, I mean, that's... Like, I can't, I can't overstate just how dumb it looked. But uh, anyway, like, the idea that Roland Schoffi, that he would have slipped into doing something like that, uh, like, some people could count him out, but uh, I, I didn't quite, and... Uh, like, uh, why I think that that's, that's the right position is because the lovers definitely has greatness to it. And it's that uh, story within the story. So, uh, like, it's just my own personal take in that the, the metaphysical aspect of the lovers, uh, uh, to me that's a miss. And uh, the movie would be served better if it was just... Um, uh, the kind of an old-time adventure romance, uh, like uh, something like The Four Fathers or something. So, like, uh, or Gunga Din or whatever. 
like uh, if it was to kind of uh, uh, you know romance about uh, 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 you know uh, getting caught in a strange situation in uh, uh, being a stranger in a strange land and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, some sort of a romance adventure thing like uh, uh, I would definitely like to feel more and uh, I just think that, that there's such uh, an uh, assured direction going on in the 18th century India sequences like Roland Joffe he like he could uh, do that kind of forfeit uh, so Gunga Din type story and uh, like no matter how many flops, no, man, no matter how many misfires he ha he has had, like he could knock that kind of a story out of the park, like uh, you know just uh, just brilliantly. Like there are flashes of absolute brilliance in the lovers, like uh, the generic title does the movie absolutely no favors, and uh, and. Uh, just the kind of uh, like uh, 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 um, confusing marketing where people don't entirely understand what the movie is like. Like, is it a time travel movie? What is it? Like, that also does it no favors. But like, there are great moments throughout uh, the lovers and uh, I just wish that it didn't have the framing sequence it didn't have any synchronicity stuff whatever like uh, I wanted all of that out of the movie and just uh, a romance of uh, uh, George Hartnett uh, escorting uh, uh, a party behind enemy lines and uh, trying to arrive safely and then him falling in love with uh, um, a certain woman in the party that he is escorting and then uh, uh, then all of that stuff. But uh, anyway, I don't want to go too much more into the movie. I just want to say that, uh, uh, well, I'll put it like this. If the lovers didn't have the framing device, if it was just the 18th century India film, it would be my favorite Roland Joffe movie. Uh, I think right now, perhaps I would give the mission the edge. Uh, in that, uh, you know, the Ennio Morricone scoring the mission, like it's... I'd almost say that... Mm, well... Well, let's put it like this. I say that it's definitely my favorite Ennio Mor Morricone score uh, outside Sergio, <coughs> sorry, outside Sergio Leone movies. Uh, but um, uh, anyway, like the mission, I'd say it's my favorite uh, favorite Roland Joffe movie, and I I could have given the lovers the top spot because the 18th century India sequences were just so well filmed. Uh, there's such an old school uh, assurance to them that uh, I would say that it would have been my favorite Joffe movie. I can't give it the top spot now with uh, the metaphysical stuff. Uh, it didn't work for me, but I'm still gonna call The Lovers a secret success. And I'm definitely glad that I watched the movie and uh, I would recommend it that um, uh, you know, if, if people, like, uh, if there are any audience members who, say, saw The Fountain and could give it a thumbs up rather than a thumbs down, I think that th those are the viewers who uh, probably would like The Lovers more than they, they suspect. So, uh, I'd say that uh, The Lovers was still a secret success. Uh, but anyway, uh, Boonraku certainly makes the lovers look like a misfire because uh, uh, Boonraku was it was just such a such a rowdy good time. I actually can't remember the last time that I liked the movie more than the lovers. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean it's definitely it's it's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, so, 
you know, Bunraku is definitely uh, mm, well. It's definitely my favorite movie that I've seen in a long time. I, d I don't know how to uh, say more of it. Uh, uh, how to phrase it more precisely than that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so uh, the story of Bunraku is very easily described, but uh, uh, the simplicity of the rather formulaic story uh, belies the relative complexity of the movie's design. So uh, anyway, just like uh, uh, A Feast Full of Dollars by Sergio Leone, it was just a remake of Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Uh, and then uh, Walter Hill had uh, uh, his own remake of A Feast Full of Dollars because I'm assuming that Walter Hill is way more influenced by Sergio Leone than Akira Kurosawa. So that uh, uh, the way that Yojimbo turned into A Fistful of Dollars, which turned into Last Man Standing, starring Bruce Willis, uh, I, I feel like Bunraku is sort of the fourth uh, step in that chain. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, so um, the the film has uh, two main uh, uh, two characters. Uh, one played by Josh Hartnett. So uh, a stranger uh, comes into town. He has a past. Uh, he is on a quest, but he doesn't want anyone to uh, get the quest he's on. So uh, the Mysterious badass with a past <laughs> comes into town played by Josh Hartnett. And then there's another person who is on a quest uh, played by uh, a Japanese singer, I guess. Uh, I think he goes by the stage name of Gokt. Uh, so anyway... Like, uh, the Japanese person is on some sort of a mission to, uh, to avenge some sort of a wrong done against his family. Uh, so, anyway, uh, as the Japanese person goes through in a somewhat, uh, uh, sort of naive and idealistic uh, manner of, uh, trying to, uh, make things right through his uh, virtuous quest. Uh, Josh Hartnett is sort of uh, hovering around as like a more mysterious version of the uh, incoming adventure. So uh, anyway, uh, there's like a town that's uh, run by a criminal gang and both of these two adventures are trying to take down that gang and then have a big boss uh, fight at the end. Uh, so anyway, then the movie is about how they go about their uh, quest. So uh, the plot is very uh, easily stated and uh, 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 the, the script level of the movie is uh, extremely derivative and it doesn't really uh, introduce anything, anything new, uh, but, uh, I'd say that, uh, uh, because of the visual, uh, identity that the film takes, uh, even though, like, I mean, basically, uh, every spaghetti western more or less has the same, same plot, so like the Lee Van Cleef Sabata movies, they don't differ that much from the uh, Django movies, for instance. Like they are sort of, uh, they're just uh, rehashing the same spaghetti western formula. So just like uh, Bunraku, it doesn't have anything uh, novel as far as the script goes, but then the direction, uh, the the Bunraku of the movie, uh, that is certainly something uh, something unique. 
But, uh, you know, it's strange that Bunraku became a flop because, uh, like, uh, usually audiences reward filmmakers who just tell the same old stories again. The way that, you know, no, like, the, the mainstream audiences didn't penalize Avatar for seeming too familiar. Like, the audiences liked that it was, uh, like other stories that they've enjoyed. Uh, and, you know, usually the audiences reward a movie that just uh, 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 goes through the usual motions of uh, that kind of storytelling. But, uh, you know, with Bunraku, uh, it's strange that... Uh, uh, it's strange that uh, uh, out of... All movies that seem to have a really generic plot to them, uh, that uh, Bunraku had such a different response to it than, than A Fistful of Dollars, for instance. Like, uh, uh, even though A Fistful of Dollars, the script is uh, beyond generic and, uh, uh, and uh, stale for anyone who has seen Yojimbo. Like, uh, if, if you haven't seen any of those other movies, perhaps A Fistful of Dollars can be something fresh and exciting. But, like, if you watch Yojimbo first and A Fistful of Dollars second, like, there's no way that you can be excited by the script of the Leon remake. So, uh, like, the way that uh, people can give Fistful of Dollars script a pass, but then not give Bunraku a pass, it's strange. But uh, I would imagine that... Uh, like, the script will be a non-issue with Bunraku, and then how people will uh, uh, evaluate the film is due to the really unique visual identity for it, or the bunraku -ness. So if Bunraku means Japanese puppet theater, uh, uh, if Bunraku is Japanese puppet theater, uh, the way that the film gets its title is because... Um, because it's if Bunraku is something like uh, something like an animation live action hybrid, so that uh, this intentionally uh, sort of fake uh, elements, like uh, Bunraku is a movie that makes absolutely no attempt at very similitude whatsoever. Like, Bunraku is a movie that revels in the artifice of its storytelling. So that, uh, you know, if, if this was a frame in Bunraku, you'd have, like, castles made out of paper in the background or something. And that, uh, you know, uh, like a, a, a horse made out of paper would sort of bounce in the background or something. And, like, that kind of... That kind of artifice of it, which, like, uh, it's as if they are trying to do puppet theater or something. Like, that kind of artifice of the storytelling, uh, it apparently just rubbed every reviewer the wrong way. But I absolutely loved it. Like, uh, I thought that the, the, the directorial decisions with the storytelling, like, uh, I mean, they were the best thing about the movie on some level, but also, like, I mean, I just, I really thought that they really uh, just saved the whole movie. Like, uh, I mean, uh, if Bunraku was just like Walter Hill's last man standing, to me it would be a completely meaningless movie. Like, uh, I, I would have stopped watching it somewhere in the middle. Like, uh... I don't have anything too much against Walter Hill or anything like that. It's just that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you know, uh, if Yojimbo is the best, Fistful of Dollars is the second best, Last Man Standing is the third best, and then Bunraku would have been the fourth best. Like, uh, that kind of uh, uh, diminishing returns, uh, I, I just... I, I, I would have just somehow rejected the movie in the middle. But I actually think that uh, if you put these four movies uh, on the same line, uh, I, I 
just for me, uh, Bunra could uh, could give a fistful of dollars, just a bit of competition in that uh, it's my least favorite of Leonis Dollars trilogy, and uh, I just think that it lacks a bit of uh, freshness because of its uh, because it's just too close to Kurosawa's uh, Kurosawa's version. But uh, anyway, uh, like uh, the puppet theater side of Bunrako, like it's uh, like it's sort of what could conceivably give it an edge over the other versions. But then, like I would imagine that the, the strangeness of Bunrako, uh, like it cannot win itself too many fans. So. I'm probably in the minority, or well, I know I'm in the minority of uh, people who just uh, love the movie. But uh, like, if I could recommend Bunraku to a few more people to give it a chance, I think that uh, like more people could really like it than so far have liked it because just like me, uh, like uh, most people have never heard of Bunraku. And then if you would see a trailer, you'd say that, well, that looks stupid. I don't want to watch it. But like, if you would give it a chance, I think that uh, there are quite a few people who could really like it. Now, Bunraku, it most reminded me of uh, Guillermo del Toro's storytelling. So that, uh, uh, that Crimson Peak movie, for instance, uh, the way that uh, uh, it just... Uh, like that movie made zero, just zero attempt at very similitude. It just relished in the storytelling tropes. Like uh, Guillermo del Toro, like he loved the kind of horror cliches that he was doing. He loved the gothic uh, cliches that have been done to death, but he just thought that you know, he wants to make them in a more flamboyant and glorious manner than, than anyone has ever made them before. Like, the way that the Crimson Peak, maybe it's acquired taste, but like the people who love those types of storytelling decisions by Del Toro, I think that they could really appreciate the directorial decisions taken in Bunraku and that uh, how... Uh, that strangeness is not a weakness, but a strength. But uh, admittedly, uh, admittedly, it's an acquired taste. But uh, you know, just uh, for me, Bunraku was uh, was uh, uh, you know the biggest secret success that I expect to uh, run into in this. Uh, uh, in this uh, series. Now, uh, like uh, I should say that uh, because Ron Perlman is the big boss villain in Bunraku, like perhaps something like that would point to Del Toro. But like, I mean, I definitely see links to uh, Guillermo Del Toro's filmmaking style throughout Bunraku. So uh, it, it's just that I would... I would dare recommend that everyone who likes Guillermo del Toro, like they should give Bunraku a chance. Maybe they won't like Bunraku as much as they like del Toro movies, but like definitely some people could discover a hidden gem that has been unfairly neglected. But anyway, uh, just to wrap, wrap, wrap things up, uh, The Lovers, I think a minor case of secret success and Bunraku to me a major case of secret success. But uh, anyway, like I'm personally glad that I gave this to uh, box office flops uh, a chance, and uh, I hope some of you can uh, give them a chance too. Uh, but uh, anyway, that was all for me, and uh, uh, I hope I see you in some of my other flop bonnet videos as well. But uh, anyway, bye for now.